We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Autumn and Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Thank you for joining us today for episode 45. Today we speak with Dr. Dana Sarah Stanhope from Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego, California. We have the privilege of hearing from one of the quintessential leaders of our profession who has founded several outstanding programs throughout her esteemed career. In addition, she has led various national and international organizations to help our profession's continued growth. Dr. Sarah Stanhope is a professor and chair for the Department of PA Education at Point Loma, And as always, you can learn more about her impressive background on our website at papathpodcast.com. Well, Dana, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to hear about your background and your history. You've dedicated so much of your life to this profession, and I'm just thrilled that you had time to join us. Before we talk about Point Loma, let's talk about your path to becoming a PA. What led you to, to start at the Child Health Program in Colorado so many years ago? Yeah, given that this we're talking about the 80s, my path was a little different than even some of my students who were born subsequent to my education. I was married, had two children when I finally had the chance to work towards completion of my bachelor's degree. And I was absolutely dead set on med school. That was it. I was starting to read about this new thing called PA. Nurse practitioners were just starting to bubble up. I wasn't interested. And part of the reason I wasn't interested is I my undergraduate major was anatomy, and I, I knew that surgery was where I wanted to be. My career counselor, guidance counselor, sort of said, well, you know, the problem is you're 27. No med school in the country will accept a woman with two children at the age of 27. He did say I could get you into school in Hungary, (laughs) which was an (laughs) interesting option. Um, And so I had to rethink what I wanted to do. And I know as your younger listeners, viewers hear that they'll be sort of surprised, but age discrimination, gender discrimination was still um, part of the background that we all dealt with. So I was very lucky. One of my classmates said to me, well, you know, there's this program. I was in Fort Collins, which is north of Denver. Um, There's this program down there in Denver that you might be interested in. And part of me went, no. But reality was I looked at it pretty carefully and thought, you know, that that may be the answer to what I want to do and how and and what I want to uh, uh, where I want to spend my life because it's focused in those days was entirely pediatrics. It wasn't a generalist PA program. So I went down and interviewed with them. They were lovely. Um, And they said, um, you know, why do you want to be a child health associate? And I said, I don't. I really want to go to med school. So I mean, the classic don't accept the person if they want to go to med school story. And I said, that's, you know, this is my placeholder and I'll get to do that eventually. They must, if they look back at those things, they must laugh, <laughs> laugh themselves crazy at it. But I went to the Child Health Associate Program, amazing program, graduated with some particular skills that I felt like I could use. And that was in not just peds, but my background in anatomy did lend itself to surgery. Initially, I worked at the University of Colorado as a a part-time faculty and and on a grant, but then moved over to the University of Florida, where I worked in a level two NICU for a year, prepping, getting to meet the surgeons, and then jumped over to my real clinical love, which is pediatric surgery and trauma. And I did that at U of F and then up at 
Columbia PNS in New York, where I began to make the transition from surgical education because we ran a surgical residency program at, in Florida to PA education. I was lucky to get hired part-time by PA surgery and part-time by the PA program at Harlem, which is where I met my husband, obviously, and re- really loved that mix of education and surgery. While I was doing it, I recognized that the work I was doing in resident, MD surgery residency, was always going to, I was going to have to spend a lot of energy convincing them that I had a clue what I was talking about, because I hadn't gone through the usual rite of passage, right, of an MD program in residency. And so when the opportunity came up to expand that, I was working on a doctorate at the time, to expand that and to move over entirely into a place where I thought I would have a little more credibility in PA education, I took that, I took that opportunity. And so that was what, 1993. So I've been a program director for, oh my gosh, a long time. (laughs) That's how I got, that's how I got into education. So, so when you think about back in those days, when you first got into education, and now you kind of look backwards a few decades or so, what are some of the things that you, you maybe had these assumptions back then that now you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, it's so different, or, or we could have been, it could have been so different had we not done these things? Right. I think, I think two things um, jump, jump to mind. One is learning For me, learning how people learn and getting a better grasp on that at a time when there were wonderful PA educators in the world, Carl Vassar was an enormous help to me, Reggie Carter, enormous help to me, so generous in in helping me lift up a program and then with curriculum issues that I would have been absolutely clueless about. So that um, understanding of the structure of how we help people learn. I think we were just sort of beginning to get a grip on that in PA education, because to be perfectly honest, as I talked to the older guys, the truth was PA education was was enormously creative because you could fly by the seat of your pants, right? So there were, there was no, uh, there was accreditation, but it wasn't like it is now. There were a certifying body, but it wasn't like it is now. And I'm not going to say that was good or bad, that there were some things that really allowed us to push education forward because you could be very creative and try new things. But it also meant that we were um, bringing in absolutely naive people like me into leadership positions where some of us learned it well, and I think some of us didn't. Um, And so I see it sort of advancing us, but also holding us back. And remembering at a time that the concept of PAs and our uh, the acceptance of us was still tenuous in many places. Remember, there were still states in 1993 that didn't license PAs, never mind give them prescriptive privilege. And so we had this tension between our opportunity to be creative, but our recognition that if we got too far out there, we were going to damage our long-term acceptance in the medical community. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. I think it, it seems to me from talking to so many of the founding mothers and fathers of our profession that you know, two things come to mind. One is Ian Jones said this best. He said, I stand on the shoulders of greatness of others. Absolutely. And, and, and the other thing about the, the profession is it was so collaborative back then. And, and maybe it is still to, today, but, but back then, if you didn't have that collaboration, we wouldn't have survived. Yes, yes. Yeah, so just to give uh, particularly your younger viewers an, uh, an example, when I started the Quinnipiac PA program, all I had to do was write a letter to the ARCs and stating my intention. That was it. Um, and then um, they came to see us, what, two years later or so, as we were about to graduate our first group. I can look at that trajectory in accreditation and say that was that was scary as heck, because I didn't know what I was doing. I had some good mentors who were there to help me. But had it not been the generosity of particularly Carl and Reggie, who literally sent me boxes of their curriculum, in a, they didn't have to do that. Their institutions could have been very um, proprietary and said, nope, it's ours. Good luck. Yeah. Um, but yeah. they didn't. 
And it was that sort of sense of we're a small community, we gotta hang together or we're gonna, you know, hang separately, um, was really, really critical in our in our advancement. So you started Quinnipiac University, which is a, a very infamous uh, school. I mean, they've done great things. They've been yeah. a top-ranked school for many, many years. Yep. Um, how long were you there before you started Samuel Merritt? Five years. Five, Five years. years. So we got our our we got through our accreditation process, and we're working on our second self study. I think when um, when I left. Okay. Yep. And and then Samuel Merritt, uh, we had Mike DeRosa on last season. And you know he spoke so highly of you and, and your leadership and mentorship for him. That institution, you you got that rolling. Uh, tell us a little bit about about kind of that process of starting a new program there. Yeah, it was really different because um, well, the state had an, had a process for you to, to um, stand up a graduate program in Connecticut. It really wasn't a it wasn't onerous. Um, I was surprised when California had. Uh, a, a sort of similar thing, but they are clearly were pitching. We're expecting that your program was at the at best at the associate degree program at level, and we started. Quinnipiac was at the master's level. Samuel Merritt was at the master's level, and so having those conversations with the state is, I can answer this, but it's not going to make sense if I tell you what we're doing relative to what your regs are. So that yeah. was that was a real. I think it was a learning curve for them. At that time, none of the other California programs were um, operating at that level. And I think it helped them, maybe help them think a little differently about PA programs and um, how they how they could approach um, the regulation supporting PA practice. I'm not going to suggest that we were profound in that, but I think it, it at least got them thinking a little differently. Neither of those programs were at academic medical centers, and that's where I spent my life before that. So that was a real learning challenge for me to help help the, the small universities understand what it took and the resources that it was going to take to build a, a program with the sort of underpinnings that it needed to be successful. Samuel Merritt was a different challenge because it had historically been a hospital-based nursing program and had grown into a university as a result of that strong nursing background. Having a PA program was a huge cultural shift for them that was uh, trying at times. It really challenged their thinking about who nursing was and their NP program was and then who these darn PAs were and what were they doing in their school. But it was sure. But it was sure. illuminating to look at the way the two universities approached it. Yeah, and and then was it after Samuel Merritt that you went to St. Louis University? Yes. Boy, you've got this down well. So California was a chance for me to come home, uh, and I was re- really grateful for that. Samuel Merritt went through some changes in its senior leadership that were very un comfortable for me. And the mm-hmm. culture was changing in a way that was very uncomfortable. So when um, St. Louis University, and I'd worked closely with Laura Stetzer, who'd been there forever, said, would you come look at our program? We need a department chair. It did mean, obviously, picking up and moving the family, which we would rather not have done. But what the university offered in terms of, again, being in an academic medical center And my long-term programs for the direction I wanted, um, any program I was directing to go, it made sense. That's when you and I, I think, first met because I was kind of coming up in the, whatever was the Midwest Consortium for PAEA or APAP at the time. And you were at St. Louis and I was at Midwestern with Meredith Davison. So that's right. um, Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And then, and then Emery. Which uh, again, I've, you're just such a traveler. I've, all the times I've known you, you're always off to a new, new experience. Where is she this week? One of the things that I really thought was the time to do. Um, Carl Fasser and I had conversations about this in the early 2000s. Um, about at some point, we needed to build a doctoral program. Should it be an entry level program or not? I was of the opinion that it could be an entry level program. If if it focused largely on um, adding meaningful clinical, almost for lack of a better term, residency to it, sure. St. Louis 
because we were in a college of health sciences, wasn't and not in the medical school, really wasn't in a position to do that, to stand that up. Emory was because they had K2, K2 grants, um, which are really big for translational research. And I really believe that that was the answer for PA doctorates was to take the fact that we were clinicians, clearly well clinically trained, but add that um, research ability to take the basic sciences and translate it into clinical, the clinical arena so that it made sense there. There'd been an enormous push for physicians to be trained as K, as, through the K2 system, which I think made sense. But I saw it as a real lost opportunity for, for PA programs to move into a meaningful doctorate that had um, relevance. People in the, in the science world would understand what the, what the folks had done. And so after I left the program director position, I was what, there for 10 years. So the last two years I was there, I was working on developing a, a K2 doctoral program for PAs. Those grants are, are really hard to come by. And for some, a lot of reasons, I could understand Emory's reluctance to take funding away from a tried and true method and put it towards um, a PA model, which I still to this day regret, but I can understand their, their thinking. Sure. It, it wasn't foreign. And then I had the chance to come home again. So here I yeah. am in San Diego. So, all right. So let's talk about Point Loma then. Uh, so you came to Point Loma. You started the school there. Give us your give us your background story on the school and what you what your vision has been for the school and where you're at now. So way back when I was president of PAEA, I wrote um, in one of the newsletter thingies an article called "I Don't Want to Work That Hard." After I had a student come in to me. There was a physician that we'd had a long time relationship with really wanted a PA head, a very busy practice. He really needed a PA. And she was just such a good student. I suggested she go, she wanted to stay there in the town that he was in. I suggested she go work with him. And she came back after a, maybe a rotation. I don't remember how long she was there, but she came back and said, oh, he's really got a busy practice. It's really exciting. I don't want to work that hard. So I'm not going to take his job. And I, I thought, I know I've been a, always been a little bit of, I don't know, a romantic about medicine as a vocation, but I believe it. <laughs> I, I, that may be unpopular with some folks, but that's still something I believe in my heart of hearts that it's, yeah. it's like um, putting, putting on the veil. I mean, you, you don't, you don't leave when your shift is over. You leave when the work is done. You leave when the patient's cared for. And so a student saying that to me broke my heart and it, it always stayed in my head as an important component of, of education. When PLNU first approached me, I'd worked in a faith-based institution. St. Louis is a Jesuit university, but I hadn't been um, exposed to one that was so outward facing in its Christianity and built it. it it's um, an integral part of the, of the work here. So I opened their webpage and the first thing that I saw was President Brower's statement about vocation. And I thought, oh, this, this speaks to me in a way that almost anything else they could have said would have gone right over my head. Well, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when I came out and visited with them, it was so clear. They were talking about faith as a vocation, but they understood when I said medicine as a vocation. They could I wouldn't want to say make that leap. That sounds pejorative, but that made sense to them. And the more I talked to them, the more I thought I have had the chance to, as an ARCPA site visitor, as a consultant, see small universities, and this is a small university, decide to build a PA program for a lot of reasons, some financial, some mission driven, but not really understand what they were getting into. And I, I know you've seen that, Kevin. It's so, yeah. it's so sad and it's so common. It was very clear to me that this university had done its due diligence. They understood what it was going to take. They have never, never said no to me. They sort of said, well, we need to approach this a little differently. How can we change our policies or can you wiggle your policies a little? But they've never said no. And that's, that's been my experience at this university, that 
that they do, that PLNU says it's going to do something, they do it. They say they're going to build something, they build it. They say they're going to give us the support we want or need, and they do it. And to me, that's been revelatory because it gives us, my team, I have an amazing team, the opportunity to build something new and different. And they haven't been frightened. They haven't looked over my shoulder. They've trusted that we, <laughs> maybe to their detriment, I don't know, but <laughs> they've, they've, they've trusted that we have a clue what we're doing and that we're doing it reasonably well and that we're going to ask the same of our students that we ask of the faculty. And that is that our mission is service. And ideally, our mission is to, to underserve populations in San Diego County. But as you know, Southern California has huge Ipsos areas. And yeah. so that's part of what we, part of what we're designing and part of what the university is saying, are you doing service? How are your students um, melding that with their studies? How do we make sure that there's good balance for them? I mean, it's, uh, I could wax rhapsodic about this school for a long time because they are just amazing. That's great. That is fantastic. So, so the school started when? The program started in um, 2020. We had our accreditation site visit. Ouch. Um, it was virtual. And we all double ouch on that one. <laughs> um, and then admitted our first uh, class in fall of 21. Very good. And, and how long is the program? 28 months. Pretty traditional in that regard. Four semesters of didactics and then three, three semesters, a calendar year of clinicals. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's great. And as you look at the, the students that you're recruiting, what, what's kind of the advice you're giving applicants for your program to become a well-positioned applicant? That's a good question. Um, I think the thing that we focus on is we measure not just your academic preparedness, but your um, history of contribution to your community, either through your church or just through community service. And so we, we tell people that. That's as important to us as your academic preparedness. And we help use that, shall I say, as a sorter that sort of it, it rises in importance as we, look at, uh, as we look at someone's, not just GPA, that's important, but their history of, of community service. And so we end up with a class that's, um, I almost have to tell them to back off a little bit on the service because they need to spend a little time with their textbooks. Yeah, um, yeah. And, but that's, wonderful because they're they're doing that one of the things that is i think unique to our program and and if i'm uh, wrong i hope um somebody will correct me is that we build in dedicated time for their service i know at um, emory we had a strong history of service with the migrant farm workers and similarly at SLU, here we've taken the month of august and all they're doing is service we, we set them up with local uh, san diego not-for-profit agencies that are serving uh, underserved populations, underserved, those who are underserved because of their economic status and put them in there for, um, for a month and then ask them to write a reflective paper. We also, one of our two um, electives in the clinical year must be service oriented. It must be with a population with whom you are less familiar, less comfortable. And the first obviously isn't designed to deliver medical care. They're not far enough along in their training, but the service elective in the clinical year is designed to provide medical care. So I think we've, That's wonderful. we've expected it. Up, we expected it a front end and now we're saying it's almost not voluntary. And if you approach this with, I'll say the right thing to get in the door and didn't really mean it, you're probably not going to be happy with us because we do expect it of you. Yeah, that, that is so important, right? Because each program has its own DNA. Yeah. And, and if you're clear, which you are up front, you're saying exactly what you're looking for and what the experience will be. And if somebody's trying to fake it till they make it, you're right. They're going to be miserable and they're going to struggle in school. That's right. So That's yeah, right. Better, better that they find the right fit and, and focus on getting into that school rather than just getting into a place because they think they can get in. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. So is it, I'm curious that that first month, is that part of a, a course that it's a service, service learning curriculum yes. component? We have a four semester didactic course called Medicine and Society. And it's um, people who are familiar with the ARC standards. I would say it's a lot of the B ones, right? All of those little bits of component that don't really 
live in a logical course. Um, but so we tried to tie them together in a, in a sequential course that also includes uh, our learning communities, our learning society. So it's grappling not just with the pathophysiology and diagnostics, it's also dealing on a case basis with uh, social determinants of health, medical ethics, um, and their service as well. So yeah. how do you take care of someone there where you don't speak their language, you don't know their culture, um, et cetera? Yeah. So Point Loma is currently in the provisional stage of accreditation, correct? Yes. Yes. And and have you you'll have your second site visit soon? October of 23. Okay. Okay. Not that we're counting down or anything. <laughs> uh, you know, for those that don't know, PA educators live and die by those site visits. It's just, <laughs> it's the bane of our existence. They're, they're important, yes, but, yes, but. <laughs> yes, but, yes, but. Yes, but. Um, speaking of accreditation, Dana, so you, you've actually done leadership in a lot of different ways. Let's talk a little bit about your leadership experiences, if we could. You're, uh, you were chair of the ARC for accreditation at one point in time. Uh -huh. You were president of PAEA when I was uh -huh. on the board. You're the first president of the International Academy of Physician Associate Educators. What are some of those leadership lessons you've learned that you you think really apply for PAs in the workforce? And and also tell us some, some of the stories of those three roles and what you enjoy the most. Oh, that's a tough question. It really is for me because I think sometimes my leadership has evolved just because I'm the I'm in the wrong place at the right time, depending on your, your viewpoint. And it, it just sort of evolved because of where I was at that point in time in my career. I think, I think part of what I've learned is if you're, particularly if you're in an organizational leadership like PAEA or ARC, then the staff that you work with in those organizations are critical to your success as a volunteer leader. And I'm not sure I entirely understood that when I was at the ARC. It took a while for me to come understand the, not just the tensions, but the support and communication and collaboration that happens when you have a, a good staff, when you're both on the same uh, trolley, if you will, and yeah. trying to go the same direction. The other thing I've learned, I've learned a lot about my weaknesses as a leader, perhaps more than I've learned about strengths, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and that's been expressed actually in program director leadership as well, so which maybe suggests that I haven't learned anything over all these years. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I highly doubt that. Well, I, I think that uh, I think one of the most important things I've learned over those amazing opportunity is, is humility, how, how little I know and how much I have to learn from the people around me and that how important it is that I may have a vision and it could be way wrong. It could be not, not appropriate, not the right time, not the right people. And that may or may not be me is not the right people. Um, and that, that when I'm a, when I'm a good listener, when I'm an active listener, I, I help make better decisions, but that no good leader drives the train alone, as, as you know, right? You, yeah, yeah. You have to have people who believe in what you're trying to do. And if you can't communicate that vision, that probably means the vision's wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. If you don't have clarity of your message, then it's it's probably not the right message. Exactly right. Yeah. I, so I think, uh, you know, that's that in itself, those are really good reflections, right? Insights into your own leadership strengths and weaknesses and growth. And, you know, humility, that's certainly... You know, it's tough. It's <laughs> tough sometimes to be humble when you're in those roles because you've been kind of elected to be to rise to this occasion and, and you feel some pressure to uh, produce. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But but to your point, it sounds like the one of the bigger lessons is that production is, is a team effort always. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you can be a cog in the wheel and sometimes you can be there just to help spur it along a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I was reminded of that. Um, the folks here at PLNU are so lovely and generous and supportive, and and um, I get all kinds of plaudits from them with some regularity. We're so glad you're here. You're doing an awesome job. And I finally had to say to my dean, stop saying that. And he was like, what do you mean? And I said, 
second Corinthians talks about being puffed up with pride. I'm trying not to do that. Right. It's really yeah. okay. It's not, you can stop because I might start <laughs> listening only to those messages and not the, the corollary, which is Danny, you, you really need to pay attention to this problem before it gets out of hand. Yeah. Yeah. Does it feel different for you uh, being home and leading a program being really close to, to where you grew up? No, because I hadn't lived here since in San Diego since 19, what, 76, 78. Okay. So it's changed um, and a lot. It's changed so much. Changed so I live, um, anybody who knows the area, I live in East County. In 1972, East County, which is just the eastern part of San Diego County, uh, this, this was back of beyond. Nobody lived here. And now it's, you know, quite populated. It's, so it's very yeah. different. Yeah, I, I spent a little bit of time in San Diego when I was in the Navy. I was at Balboa Naval Hospital oh, for sure. for about eight weeks, and then I also trained. I did SEER training at Warner Springs, California. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a. I love that San Diego is a beautiful spot. I'm I'm blessed to be here, even though traffic is you know California. I'm I'm blessed yeah. to be here. Any final things you want to share with us about Point Loma or about your career? Any uh, pearls of wisdom before we go? Pearls of wisdom. I don't think I have pearls of wisdom. I can just say that um, the story I told you at the beginning of I'm not going to be a PA, right? That's not being, I, I've never, I looked back once and thought, oh, maybe I should have um, just because Pete's surgery is so hierarchical. Um, but the truth is that I have been so blessed through this career to, I've traveled the world on the basis of being a PA. I've had the opportunity to work as an educator with such extraordinarily talented people. I've worked with 300 programs just blows me away. And I haven't worked with that many in the great scheme of things, but still have had the chance to work side by side with some amazingly creative educators. And without getting too flaky, God knew what he was doing. And I didn't go to med school <laughs> more than mm -hmm. I did. So I, I've just been so blessed by this. Yeah. It's interesting as you think back to how the medical community would not have accepted you at the age of 27 with two kids. And I think that's changed to some extent, but yes, but, yes, but still tough. But yet the PA community brought you in with a hope, brought a surgical, a, a wannabe surgical PA yeah. into a child health pediatric <laughs> program. Yeah. That just goes to show you that we're just a, we're kind of a strange group. <laughs> we, we are. And I'm really grateful for it. <laughs> yeah. That their willingness to look past a really stupid message of, I don't really want to be a PA. Right. Yeah. We, we didn't talk about Bill at all, but I have to just give a shout out to Bill. Um, you know, your husband is one of the uh, typical questions in the challenge bowl, uh, mm -hmm. because I believe Bill was the first, he was the president of AAPA when they had their first meeting in Texas, somewhere, yeah. as I recall. Wichita Falls. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's been fun for the two of you to kind of ride this career in different ways uh, throughout the, the last 30 years. Yeah. Because he's a, um, he's, he's founded two PA programs as well over the course of his career. And so, the, the thing that maybe that'll make um, young program directors um, happy to hear is that I come home from work and talk about X, Y, or Z. And he says, I couldn't do what you do because the sort of regulations that either the ARC restrictions or state restrictions or whatever have made, have made standing up a program and then getting people through a program very different than it was almost 50 years ago when PAEA was yeah. founded. Yeah. Um, and and there are moments when I think, oh, this is a young person's game. I need to get out. But um, <laughs> but he but he brings such a wealth of, uh, of experience and perspective that I am equally blessed when I can lay a problem in front of him and we can talk about what his experience tells him, what my experience tells me. And, and it's, um, it's a, a blessing that not many people have, I think. And yeah, having your yeah. spouse understand what you do. I I agree. I agree. That's really awesome. I, I can't thank you enough for your leadership over the years. It's been such a privilege for me to serve alongside of you in some capacities. And I'm delighted that you're still in the game. And thank you thank for you. this podcast. Well, we want to thank our guest, Dr. Dana Sarah Stanhope, for her insights into the PA program at Point Loma Nazarene University and for sharing her story about her time in our profession and all the contributions she has made to PA education. 
tune in next week when we speak with Ms. Laura Gerstner, the Associate Program Director at the Campbell University BA Program in North Carolina. Laura talks to us about her career in orthopedics, her career as a PA educator, and her work at the national level as a member of the PAEA Clinical Coordinators Workshop and also the PAEA Leadership Mission Advancement Commission. Until next time, we wish you success with whatever path you are walking in life, and thank you for joining us. The purpose of this podcast is to provide news and information on the PA profession and is for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the speakers and guests and do not necessarily reflect the official position or policies of the University of Arizona. 